The Money Lender by Vincent Starrett from Weird Tales, September 1923. Send him in, cried the warty man suddenly, with something between a snarl and a cry. The door marked private opened to admit a shrinking figure, then was discreetly closed. The man who entered giggled hysterically by way of greeting, removing a cracked derby at the same instant. He was stoop-shouldered and frail. His upper lip quivered curiously. Yet in his attitude there was a sort of desperate humor, a pathetic braggadocio. He waited in twitching nervousness, twirling his cracked derby in his hands. "'Sit down,' said Martin Hoganson, immersed in a letter file. His voice grated like a rusty hinge, but the words were automatic. The man addressed jumped as if the penetrating voice had been a sudden knife thrust sharply into him. His maudlin giggle again escaped. He dropped into a chair near the door and swung his left leg over his right, then after a moment reversed the performance. Finally, he placed both feet squarely together before him on the floor. His pale eyes fixed themselves on a calendar on the rear wall. The calendar had been a gift of a great banking institution. The legend across its top panel read, Pay all bills by check. You will spend less money this way than if you have the cash about you. In a moment, the searcher at the oak cabinet swung to attention. He glanced at the man in the chair out of poached eyes, then darted a look at the clock. Right on the dot, eh, Smith? he observed. The visitor's voice cracked in a mirthless smile. I was an office man myself, once. Were ya? said Martin Hogason without interest. As the other did not reply, he continued, Well, I suppose you didn't make an appointment to tell me that, eh? Martin Hogason's mannerisms were peculiar. His life had been attempted twice. Ha ha! Of course not! giggled the victim of this pleasant irony. If only Hogason were not so damn fat, he thought. Others in their time had been irritated by Mr. Hogason's fatness. I guess you know why I'm here, Mr. Hogason, smirked the man Smith. I wrote a letter. I hoped. I read it, said Martin Hogason. And of all the damned drivel I have ever read, it was the worst. The visitor was shocked. I hoped. Yeah, said Hogason in a deep scorn. They all do. And what good does hoping do me? They all hope and none of them pay. You mean you won't, you can't? Nothing doing, said Martin Hogason solidly. It's flat, Smith. You ought to know better. The thin man drooped in his chair. This is what he had feared. His forced smile vanished. Mr. Hogason, he said desperately, I ain't lying. My wife is sick. I am sick. I can't do it. I ain't lazy. I'm willing to work. But you know what chance a man's got at my age? Eagerly confidential, he concluded, I ain't even got the rent. The moneylender toyed thoughtfully with a penholder. You've had time, Smith, he said. We've been pretty lenient. We extended your time two weeks ago. Last month you were three weeks late, and the month before you was a week late. Looks like we've been pretty good to you. I ain't a hard man, but I can't afford to get sentimental. You couldn't just give, um, just a week, pleaded Smith. Not a day, said Hogason. I'm awfully sorry, Smith. But there you are. I'm a businessman, and so are you. Sentimental don't pay. You know that. You knew what you was doing when you signed our agreement. We made good, and you didn't. That's all. It's all straight. And it's all legal. He looked defiantly at his visitor, as daring him to deny it. The little man was blinking. He seemed, somehow, to have shrunk in height. Can't you give a fellow a chance? he whispered. A chance? 
echoed the money lender. I ain't driving you. It ain't me. It's a plain business. Smith, can't you see? He adjusted his tie reproachfully. The rings on his lifted fingers angered the visitor, who leapt to his feet. Business beep! At the height of his indiscretion, Smith weakened. I gotta have it, he said. I tell you, I gotta have it. Good God, he hoarsely whispered. Don't you even think of anything but business? Doesn't it mean anything that you're breaking me? I ain't gonna argue with you, said Hogason. You're excited. Excited? Quite suddenly, Smith became excited. He went to pieces in an instant. You're a lying crook, he shrilled. You damn thief! You— The moneylender smiled. Tut, tut, he deprecated. This won't do, Smith. I'm treating you pretty white. Pretty white. I've told you I'm sorry for you. Look here now. You go out and rustle up some money someplace, any place, and bring it in tomorrow. That'll give you a day. I don't want to be hard on you. Here, have a smoke on me. He extracted a gaudy cigar box from the drawer and extended it across the flat desk. The man Smith seemed frozen with horror. He resisted an impulse to seize a handful of costly cigars and hurl them into the face of Martin Hogason. Though the ghastly humor of the situation struck him, his anger became deadly. He stretched out a hand and transferred one of the cigars from the box to his pocket. All right, Hogason, he said insolently. I'll take it, because I think it's the only thing you ever gave away for nothing. I want to save it as a souvenir, in case I should forget you. His eyes fell upon the calendar. Pay all bills by check, it said. You will spend less money. He turned away, a crooked smile twisting his mouth. Martin Hogason watched him with puzzled eyes. Vaguely alarmed, the moneylender saw his visitor open the door, heard the door close behind him. With a swift shrug, the warty man resumed his earlier occupation. Outside the tall building, the man Smith stopped, bewildered. He was still dazed. About him were hurrying men who looked at their watches and walked with nervous haste. Messenger boys drifted in and out of the maze of traffic with incredible accuracy. A stream of autos and trucks rolled up the street on one side and down the street on the other. Streetcars clanged past. Smith knew that they were carrying busy men on their way to keep business appointments. He glanced up at the telegraph wires strung over his head and seemed to hear them hum with unseen messages. Business messages. Everything spoke of business, the hideous monster that had ruined him, and that now threatened to engulf his family. It was as if the whole mystery of life, its madness, its futility, suddenly had been made clear to him. The corner on which he stood marked the intersection of two business thoroughfares in one of the largest business cities in the world. It was all for money. How he hated it money a golden calf before which bowed down in idolatry an insane universe something like this was in his thoughts but the utterance struggling for articulation came forth as tears god the kids would expect him home shortly a horrible humor lurked in the situation the money he so despised was what he needed most well, he had made up his mind to get it. From his side pocket he drew forth the expensive cigar, Hogason's cigar. He looked at its rich coloring, its garish label. A smile curled his lips. He tore away the paper band and ground it beneath his heel, finding a savage pleasure in the childish performance. He had said he would keep the cigar, but would he? It had been a senseless remark theatrical he would do better to crush it in his hands as if it were hogason's oily throat or happy thought 
mail it back to its abominable donor but anger was past coolness was what he needed now as for the cigar by heaven he would smoke it with the cynical humor of a defeated man he touched a match to the weed and watched the smoke curl past its fiery tip as he smoked he mused knocking the ash from his cigar onto a window ledge of the tall building that braced his back high up in the building was the office of martin hogerson who by nightfall would have ceased to exist in his pocket there was left just enough to buy something he had thought he would never have occasion to use something his wife was afraid to have around the house because of the kids they would expect him home shortly he smiled at the little heap of ash on the window ledge and without framing the thought knew that it was significant of life then he hurled the cigar butt into the street and rapidly walked away when Martin Hogerson left the building an hour later, a husky breeze was blowing. He turned up his collar, muttering suave imprecations. His mind still vaguely dwelt on the deadly whiteness of the man Smith's face. Damn him, said Hogerson, as he moved toward the curb. He almost threatened me. A fellow like that is dangerous. He ought to be in jail. By God, if he knew I didn't dare close him up, he'd make trouble I'll bet he's scared stiff he'll get the coins somewhere I know these fellows they can always get coins somewhere when they have to with this logic and pleasing thought Martin Hogerson stepped off the curbstone into the street at the same instant a little puff of wind caught the heap of cigar ash on the window ledge and scattered it a flake of inconsiderable size blew swiftly toward the street it lodged in the moneylender's eye with an oath hogerson drew a handkerchief from his pocket and applied it to the stinging member he had taken several steps into the road but now he turned to retrace them the handkerchief was still tightly pressed to his eye look out shrieked a man's voice in sudden fear and there came a grinding of brakes and a shriek of a motor siren then something exploded in Martin Hogerson's brain and as the automobile came to a stop the watchers knew if they gave it a thought that all the money in the world would not restore the breath of life to that lump of sudden clay the end of the money lender by Vincent Sterrett